is Adam Golov, Marketing Communications Manager at Data Conversion Laboratory, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know we will allow time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers, so please write your questions in the chat area as they come to mind. If we don't have time to answer them all, we will make them available on our website. For those of you who are not familiar with DCL, we convert and organize content to create electronic documents, populate databases, publish on the web, and basically get it ready for tomorrow's technology. DCL services help you refine your document conversion strategy, identify document redundancy, extract metadata, and transform legacy and future documents for real needs, today and in the future. DCL serves a broad client base spanning all industries. Today, we are thrilled to introduce India Amos of CN Times Books, Laura Dawson of Barker, and Alan Lieberman of DCL. Without further ado, welcome India, Laura, and Alan. Great, thanks. Hello. Hi. So, um, Adam, do you have to give control? Yep, I just gave you control. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see my screen yet, or not? No. You should. Okay. There should be a button to click up. Yeah. Up. Okay. Um. Bear with me one second. Mm -hmm. Let's try this. I. Ah, here we go. All right. How's that? Are we there yet? <laughs> yes, we are. Okay, great. Excellent. So um, it's, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce India Amos, um, who uh, is, uh, as Adam said, at uh, <coughs> uh, CN Times Books. Um, India has, um, has given a lot of advice to a lot of people about uh, ebook uh, design and conversion, about um, uh, print layout and design. Um, she's also served as a copy editor, a bookseller, and has been a managing editor. Um, so India has a wealth of experience, and I'm uh, very happy that she's agreed to do this with us. Um, I want to just sort of uh, set the stage <clears throat> for uh, how India is going to proceed um, by talking about the various formats that um, books are published in. There's a lot that you have to think about when, uh, when you're talking about production and design, and it starts with how do you want the book to look? Um, <clears throat> what kind of product are you looking for? Um, if you're looking for a print product, you have to decide do you want to publish it in hardcover or just in paperback? How big do you want it to be? And that's what trim size refers to. How big is the paper? Um, what type of paper are you going to use? Um, and, and these are questions that um, <clears throat> a lot of folks who are um, doing this for the first time um, encounter and, and really don't quite know um, what to do and, and what course to take. Um, binding type, do you want it to be perfect bound um, like uh, most paperbacks are? Do you want it to be um, stapled, spiraled? Um, there are lots of different types of bindings. Um, how do you want the pages glued into the cover? Um, what layout are you looking for? What design elements do you want to include? What types of fonts do you want to include? Um, so these are these are all decisions that uh, when you're um, when you're publishing a print book, you really have to to give some thought to because your book is 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 your product and you want it to look as as best as it can and to support the content of that book. Um, in terms of digital formats, um, you know, in addition to, okay, am I going to publish just as EPUB or am I going to publish just as Kindle, um, you, need to talk, you need to talk about fonts again. Um, what type of fonts render well on ebook reading devices? Um, the layout is really critical there too. How does the book flow? Um, what design elements do you want to use uh, within the, the file? And um, responsive design is something you do have to think about with digital books that you don't have to think about necessarily um, with, with print books. And what, what that means is how is this book going to look on a phone versus a Kindle versus 
tablet versus a, a laptop. Um, people are reading in all kinds of different ways, and so the same file has to be um, suitable for all of these different platforms. And of course, there are different file formats for different ebook vendors, different apps, different devices. <clears throat> so all of these things have to be taken into consideration. Um, what's important to remember is that you, it, it, production and design is, is really one place where you definitely get what you pay for, um, which is to say if you're trying to do it for um, as close to free as possible, it's not going to look that professional. Um, my colleague Brian O'Leary, um, in his consulting practices, always says begin with the end in mind. What are you looking for? What do you want the book to look like at the end? What would you be proud to put in a bookstore or to distribute to colleagues or, or what have you. Think about that and then everything else will follow from that. So India, to do the deep dive, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, okay. And is that working? Uh, it's showing my screen, supposedly. Is it actually showing anything? Uh, hold on, let me go back. Yes! Okay. Does that look right? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interview, yeah. <laughs> no, I've, I've, I've done that too. Okay. <laughs> Let's just skip through. I don't usually use PowerPoint because I do everything in InDesign, which we'll be talking <laughs> about a lot. Um, so first off, the first thing you think of when you're trying to set up a book, you usually, this is the easy decision. You think, oh, I want it to be a hardcover or I want it to be a paperback. That's, most people um, know what that is right off. And, but there are still a lot of decisions to be made from that point. Is your hardcover going to have a jacket? Is it going to be printed right on the case wrap? Um, do you want your case wrap to be paper or fabric? Um, if it's a paperback or, or a hardback, what kind of a binding do you want? Is it, if it's a cookbook, do you need it to lie flat on the table? On the other hand, if you have a spiral binding to let it lie flat on the table, once that book is on the shelf in the bookstore, the spine is out and you can't see anything. There are hybrid bindings where there's paper that wraps through the middle of the metal coil so you can still read text through it and you get the lay flat. So there are all these decisions to be made with binding. Um, your, those decisions are largely going to be determined by which printer you go to. Many printers will have a limited array of bindings that they can do. So you need to make these decisions first for what you need and then you need to find printers who can do that. Um, can I lay out my book in Word is um, something that a lot of authors who are trying to publish their own books do or publishers that are trying to do things on a very small scale because everybody has Word or something like Word and it's very tempting. You know, you can change the fonts, you can uh, make it look very much like a book page. This is also tempting to a lot of authors who are publishing with traditional large publishers. They will set up their whole manuscript to look like they think the final book is going to look and then the um, production staff at the publisher get it and they strip all of that out and start fresh. Um, so you can theoretically use Word to make a book that looks like a book, but to professionals it will still look like it was typeset in Word. You just don't have as much control. Um, there are a lot of other programs that you can use to do this, uh, varying degrees of control, varying degrees of practicality for depending on how long your document is. Um, if you're just doing a 16-page or 8-page um, color booklet, like a children's book or something, you could do it in Illustrator and you probably won't tear all of your hair out. Um, you could do it in Photoshop. I really don't recommend that. Um, some of these other programs, Microsoft Publisher, Apple Pages, eh, not that much better than a word processing program in my opinion. Quark Express is a long-time industry standard that I personally hate. Um, Tech is an open source package. Um, it has a bit of a learning curve, but and it's it's best for technical content, I think. But it it is very flexible and full feature if you can put in the time to learn it. My preference is InDesign, um, and so most of my uh, comments will be InDesign based, and my examples will be InDesign based. But some of it will be general stuff about fonts. So um, 
these are the sorts of things you're trying to control in your page layout program. And this is why it's something like Word doesn't work very well, because you just can't make precise adjustments that you need to make the page look convincing. And that's a lot of what you're doing with book design, is you're trying to create an experience for the reader that makes them find your book believable. You want them to trust you. You want them to think that you know what you're talking about, that you're a reliable narrator. Um, and there are a lot of very subtle decisions that are made in the page layout that create that, that feeling in the reader. Um, and you may not, as a reader, know why you feel that a book is or isn't believable when you open it for the first time. But those, those cues are, are definitely there. They're very subtle. And if you are a reader, you're familiar with them. You've been seeing them all your life. So um, just some quick things I want to point out here that are important. Um, letting over on the sort of middle left side is the spacing between the lines. This is very important for readability. Um, also, if you're printing POD, those colored margins are important. Um, a lot of uh, POD books are, don't use bleeds. Um, some, some POD printers may not allow bleeds. That is, if any design element runs off the edge of the page. If you're doing a picture book, like a children's book, it's almost certainly going to need bleeds. Um, a printer like, say, Blurb, they assume that you're going to need bleeds because they do photo books. But say Lightning Source, it's not all of their um, books may allow that. And at some printers, that inside gutter margin, if you have an image that's running across the page, as you would often have in a children's picture book or something, you will still have to leave a white gap down the middle for the binding. So that's another reason why you want to figure out who you're printing with before you start laying out the book, because it's a real pain to go back and change everything afterward. So there are all of these decisions to make. I did some, uh, here at CN Times, we had some books that were typeset before I started here. Um, and I saw them and immediately redid them. So these are actual before and afters. Um, the left-hand panel is uh, typeset by an outside typesetter, and the right-hand panel is typeset by me. The text has changed somewhat because these are different. Um, production passes, but you can see there are lots of little details on each page that make the right-hand side, I think, look more professional, um, look like a book that you are used to seeing in a bookstore, and the left side look like, frankly, like it was typeset in Microsoft Word. Um, there are a lot of decisions about things you might not ever think about, like tables of contents. You've probably never set one up before if you've never done a book. Um, there are lots of different styles for them. Do you need to say chapter? If it's a novel, everybody knows it's a chapter probably, so you can just put the number. But you want to distinguish it from page numbers. Another thing that you'll often see in unprofessionally done books is these dotted leaders in the left-hand side where you have the dots leading out to the page number. That's an immediate mark of amateurism. You almost never see that in a professionally typeset book. Um, it's just tacky. And, and it's not very reader-friendly. Um, here it's more an issue of, of style, of taste, of what's the feeling that you want the book to have. This is a novel. Um, and to me, the design on the left looks like it's an academic monograph. This is clearly a template that the typesetter had. And they use it for all kinds of stuff. And it doesn't suit the material at all. Um, in this case, the, the right-hand design is actually that little circle with the lines coming out of it is picking up a design element from the book's jacket. So the inside of the book is tied to the outside of the book. Um, another thing you can see here pretty well on this page spread is the difference in the spacing of the type. If you look at, if you sort of squint, if, or if you're me and your vision is bad, you don't even have to squint to do this, um, you can see gaps in the type on the left-hand side. There are these sort of white rivers of text, particularly in the last paragraph. There's a line that runs diagonally. Um, you want to avoid that kind of thing. And that's the sort of thing that it's very hard to get control over that in a non-professional typesetting program. It can be, in extreme cases, very distracting to the reader. Um, this is from another book, but again, it's a before and after. 
Um, and it's, it's a matter of information design. This is a chapter opener. You'd never know from looking at the left-hand panel that this is the beginning of a chapter. It's hard to tell what that first paragraph is. Um, it's an epigraph that is introducing the chapter, but it's not set off really from the main text. I don't know, you know, is this, is this just a quote? Is it supposed to introduce everything? So on the right, that information design is a bit clearer. Um, it's also, there's a clearer uh, distinction between the different levels of headings. So these are just all the kinds of decisions that you have to make. There are a lot of them. Every page in a typeset book, these kinds of decisions come into play. Um, another thing that you'll see in a lot of non-professional books is there's just there's no grid. Everything is just kind of thrown on the page. Um, in some cases it's stretched to fit the height of the page. Um, regardless of what's on it, and it, to me, I, I talk about it like it, it'll give you seizures. It just it, it gives you this feeling of unease that something is not quite right, that the pages are not balanced across the spread, and it's awkward. So I like to throw everything on grid. Um, another thing, just to note at the top of that left-hand page is the running head that's turning over because it's too long. This is a case of really poor planning. The first thing the typesetter should have done was look at all the chapter titles, figure out what's the longest one and what's the shortest one, and figure out a design that will accommodate both and plan around that. Um, it's not a fair cons comparison here because I don't show what that running head would have looked like in my design, but what I ended up doing was shortening the really long running heads and abbreviating them so that they would fit. Um, but I also used smaller type than that, so I didn't have to abbreviate them quite as much. Um, and then things like notes, if you're doing uh, a book that has end notes. I don't know what they were thinking here, um, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's really unattractive and just nasty, <laughs> as the heading <laughs> says. <laughs> um, so you, know, you kind of get an idea. Um, so when we, were, when we were putting together slides, uh, Laura came up with the, the sort of general headings and, and fonts was in there and um, I, I immediately, the first thing I get asked whenever I, I tell people that I design books is, oh, so you pick the fonts, so this is a real, this pushes my buttons. Um, <laughs> picking the fonts is the least part of what you do. It's important, but it's really, it's one of the last decisions that you make in putting together a book. Um, Text design, as you've seen from all those samples, is a combination of the font and the size and the length of the line and what we call H and J's, which I'll talk a little bit about later, the letting, which I pointed out in that diagram, the spacing between the lines, the page depth, which is the number of lines on the page, um, and the margins, which, you know, they might be even on all four sides. I tend to like to put more space on the outside because that's where you hold the book, obviously. Um, but you also don't want to cut it too close in the middle because you're going to lose some paper into the binding, depending on what kind of binding you have. Another reason why you have to plan that before you start laying out your book. Um, good design also starts before you ever think about typesetting your book. It starts when you're writing the book. If you're writing your own book and publishing it yourself, you want to be thinking about it from the very beginning. If, if you learn in seventh grade, as I did, to write an outline of your paper before you start it, and I hated doing this, but I do know that this is the theory of how you do it. If you could make that indented outline at level A, level B, um, one, two, three, the Roman numerals, all that, you will have a much easier time of typesetting your book, designing your book in a way that will then make sense to the reader as they're trying to figure out what you're saying. Um, if your book does not have that kind of structure. If it's a novel, you have a lot more play, but it's still a good idea to keep it in mind as you're, as you're working, as you're editing the manuscript. A good copy editor will try to wrestle a manuscript into that kind of a format because it, it really makes everything easier down the line. Um, and then the last thing, I'm, I'm talking about these things as if I'm expecting you to design your own books and typeset them, but really, it's hard. Um, I started learning typesetting around 1998, and I'm still learning things. Every book that I do, I learn new things. Um, and that's even after spending a couple of years in what's basically a sweatshop where I typeset from morning until night. Um, it's, it is a thing that takes a long time to do. Yes, everyone knows how to use a word processor. Everyone's used to working with text. 
but it's still it's a specialized skill and if you really want your book to look good I strongly recommend that you hire a professional um, so now we can talk about fonts there are a lot of words to, de to describe fonts some of which you'll be familiar with some of which you won't um, you can look all of these up online. There is a, a great site called Typedia that is a crowdsourced Wikipedia style site all about fonts. Um, you can add information to it. You can look things up there and that will be in the resources list at the end of this pre presentation so you don't have to write that down right now. Um, but these are all, these are terms that you'll come across and um, particularly if you're working with good typesetting grade fonts um, and you'll need to know what these terms mean. A really important thing to understand is that the point size, which we're all used to seeing in your word process program or even your email app, um, is not an absolute measure of size. It means something to the type designer, but it doesn't mean something necessarily to how your page is going to look. A more important measure, in my opinion, and in, well, in general, is the X height that you see labeled on the right hand side. That is the height of the letter X, the lowercase x. And that size is what gives you your impression of how big a type is, a typeface is. Um, here, just to demonstrate the differences, these are all the same point size of type, and they're all set on the same amount of letting. And yet, these 14 typefaces have a huge range of size. And I'm only looking at serif text type typefaces. There's, there's obviously um, an even bigger range. If I had thrown some sans serif typefaces in here, you'd see a much bigger range of X heights. Um, you'd see a much bigger range of widths. But um, this, is, this is all 12 point type and on the left hand side and all 21 point type on the right. So just looking at the numbers doesn't tell you whether the typeface is going to fit and whether it's going to look good in your layout. You have to adjust the settings for whatever specific typeface you're using and the specific weight of the typeface you're using. These are all set in regular. Um, there, are, there will often be a weight called book. There will be a weight called light. Um, you generally don't want to set running text in bold, but you never know. Um, so it, it, everything depends on everything else. It's all interrelated. So talking about H and J's, this is, this is a major mark of professional typesetting. And all of those, the, the don't samples that we just looked at, use the InDesign default settings for hyphenation and justification, the ones you see on the left. And they are too loose. They're not flexible enough for dealing with bad fits. Um, and so you end up with those, right, those rivers of white space. On the right are the settings sort of my starting settings, I'll tweak them, again, depending on the specific types, typeface that I'm using and the page layout um, and, and the nature of the content. Um, but it, if you look at the, in the top screenshot, the letter spacing in particular is, it's a really useful thing that InDesign can do, that it can adjust the amount of space um, between the letters in the word if it needs to, and also the glyph scaling which is something I used to do manually when I typeset using Quark Express um, and which InDesign can do automatically for you. You don't want to put too much flex in there because it, it then becomes weird looking and, and catches, it catches attention where it shouldn't. Um, but if you put just about 2% of flex in there, it's not really visible to the naked eye and it gives you much more even color in your page. Um, so, good fonts are worth paying for. They will save you so much time and they will look better and they will set better. Um, so, it's, it's really worth it to find good fonts. You probably have some if you do own any Adobe product. I think you, you get some fonts with them. Uh, some of them are suitable for setting text. Minion is a standard one that comes with InDesign. Um, usually, there are there's at least one version of Garamond in there, um, and there's a sans serif. There are a lot of um, non-Latin fonts. That are, it usually comes with Chinese fonts, Korean fonts, sort of default stuff. Um, you can work just with those fonts, but you'll probably want to buy one or two if you're publishing more than one book. Um, if you get the Adobe Creative Suite, which is the current version, which is 
somewhat cloud-based, you can access an enormous library of wonderful fonts through Typekit, but you cannot, you don't really get to keep those fonts. You only get to embed them in a PDF, and then you can send that PDF to your printer. So just be careful if, if you're using those, make sure that your printer will accept only a PDF um, and will not ask you, oh, we need the actual InDesign files to, to print your book. Um, what fonts actually work, to get back to that first slide, these are some that I use all the time. Um, Adobe Text Pro in particular is designed for kind of low quality printing conditions. If you're using POD, that's a really good choice. Um, Minion and Myriad are, as I said, defaults. Minion sets very compactly and it's a very elegant typeface. Myriad matches it well. You will often, if you're doing a nonfiction book, you'll want to have a range of typefaces that you can work with. And so I like to often mix a serif type with a sans serif type. It's nice if, like Scala or Carmina, there's an officially matched set. Um, Minion and Myriad is a, a nice unofficial set. So that if you need to pair types, those work pretty well together. Artwork, this is a, a whole huge topic. There are big books about how to prepare art files for output, but just as a basic, basic rule of thumb, 300 DPI for print. Um, if you're doing line art, diagrams, anything with fine detail, you want to scan it at higher than that. Um, the actual resolution on a printer's printer, an image setter, is 1200 or 2400 DPI. So if you don't want your images to look blurry, you keep that in mind. Um, but 300 DPI is, is fine for most images. Vector images, usually that's logos, um, some kinds of diagrams don't have a fixed size, so you don't need to worry about it. Those will be the files that have the EPS or AI extension, or sometimes PDF. Um, and most printers will accept hard copy. They will charge you for scanning, but they can scan it for you. Um, paper. It depends on which country you're in. Um, obviously, in the U.S., we use inches and feet. In other countries, they use metric, and the paper is cut to match. So the number, the, the shapes of the books differ depending on the paper because you need to get an efficient fit on that press sheet. Um, so you will want to choose your printer first and then find out what trim sizes they are used to doing. You can do a custom size if you're using a regular commercial, commercial printer, but you will pay through the nose for it. Um, you also have to be careful, the, the last point on this, paper has grain, ignore it at your peril. I have seen expensive, expensive art books where after the book has sat horizontal, like on a desk for a while, um, it curls up like a Pringles chip because the grain has been turned the wrong way, probably to save money. And as soon as you get some humidity into the paper, the whole book warps and no longer the cover no longer closes. So um, if you're asking for something weird from the printer, you run the risk of doing that. And make sure that you ask your rep, is the grain going to be OK if we do this size? Um, a lot of this stuff I'm not, I'm not going to go through because you can read the slides later for the details. Um, there are lots of little decisions about how your book is put together, the, the packaging as it were, and um, if you read a lot, you are familiar with a lot of these. You may not have thought about whether your book should include them, but now's the time to think about it. Um, this is the way most book covers were done in, say, the 19th century, was they were stamped. Book jackets are a new development, um, they're mostly 20th century, and it used to be you got the book with a book jacket and then you immediately threw it away. Before that, you got the book and you had it rebound to match everything else in your library. So you can, you can look back for some really great models of cover design. Um, if you look on Flickr or the Library of Congress or um, any public domain image archive, and you can get fantastic ideas for, or, or even Google Books for cover designs. Um, and you might want to have embossing. You can do more than one cover, color of foil. They do charge for these foil covers. They charge by the amount of area. So if you're doing something like that middle book or the left-hand book where it's covering the whole cover, you will pay more for that. But that may be worth it. Um, this is a book that we did at CN Times. It was just released last week. You can go buy it now. Please do. Um, <laughs> we used a soft touch lamination for the black part. Um, and it's very velvety feel. 
And then for the spots, the designer set up a, a template for a spot varnish. So those obviously are shiny. When we first uh, showed the final books to the author and his wife, his wife just stood there patting the cover of the book. She just couldn't stop touching it. It's really inviting. You want to pick the book up. You want to touch it. You want to open it and see what's inside. So that's appropriate for certain kinds of projects. Um, Decalages are something you'll see on, say, a literary novel. Um, it gives it a feeling of kind of antique elegance. Um, costs more because you have to set up the press sheet just right. Um, headbands. Most hardbacks will have headbands. Many printers will not give you a choice of what colors, um, or they'll charge you more for certain colors. But if you're willing to pay a little bit extra, you can get really cool colors. So for that photo book, um, I did blue and yellow since there's a lot of green in the cover. Um, and end sheets, by default, they're just plain white or cream. You can get colored paper, or usually it's much cheaper to print them. So the one, the green one on the bottom is from the photo book, obviously. It still has that, that dot pattern on it. Um, and it's really cool. And it doesn't cost that much. I think we paid maybe $300 to have the end sheets printed for a run of 3,000 books. Um, if you're using print on demand, you will have very limited choices. And you definitely want to choose your printer before you set everything up, as I said, in case you're doing blues. You will have probably no choice of uh, headbands, case wraps, um, even uh, stamping on the spine. They're, they will give you stamping on the spine, but you don't get to choose the typeface. You don't get to choose the color of the foil that they use. Um, so keep that in mind. You, you don't have as much control if you're doing POD. That's how they make it cost effective. Um, and if you're using Lightning Source, which is what we use at CN Times, they're great, but their pricing structure is such that every time you upload a file, you get hit with a new fee. So you want to make sure that your file is perfect before you upload it, because they will send you electronic proof. You look at the proof, and then you go, oh, crap. I, I messed something up and I have to re-upload it, that's $40. Every time you do that, it's another $40. So they will, they will you know, ding you for every single one. Um, cover design, <sighs> everybody wants to design covers. Um, I want to design covers. I suck at it. I've been doing books for years, and I don't design covers if I can help it, because it's just not what I'm good at. I'm good at text. Um, if it's something like an academic monograph where people don't really buy it based on the cover, they buy it based on the content. I'm comfortable doing those. But if it's going to be a trade book that I want people to pick up in a bookstore, I want a professional to do it. Um, so hire a professional. That's my main recommendation here. Um, to be an educated consumer and to hire the right professional, figure out what you like, figure out what's appropriate for the category of book that you're doing, and um, give the designer specific examples and try to guide them, but let them do their jobs. Um, if it's an experienced book designer, they will know what bookstore reps have recommended or rejected in the past. They will have had these battles over and over and over for years of, oh, this cover is just not going to sell, or, or they'll get blamed when the book doesn't sell, oh, the cover wasn't good. And so they have, they have a lot of experience in making covers that do sell. Um, so trust their expertise. If you're planning a series, this is very important, um, let the designer know beforehand, because there are concerns for a series design that are very different from a one-off cover. And it's really helpful to the designer if you can let them plan for that. So they can say, oh, well, every book in the series will have a different color. Or every book in the series will have this little tab on the side that will change its position from book to book, or something like that. If you can tell them how many books are in the series, that's obviously ideal. If you can't, then they know to plan for that. So, and covers will cost money. Um, it's, I think, the official going rate, if you look at the Graphic Artist Guild Guide, which is sort of the industry pricing guide, um, covers are between $1,500 and $4,000 for a, a trained hardcover book. And you can, obviously you can get covers for much less than that. You can pay a lot more than that for a cover. But just keep in mind that that's the range. And don't have a heart attack when someone says, oh, we're going to charge you $1,800 to do this cover. That's perfectly normal. They're not trying to gouge you. Um, 
proofing, there are many different kinds of proofs, and depending on your type of book, you may be, you may be fine with a digital proof. I use a digital proof for most things. Um, if you're doing a color book, a POD printer like Lightning Source will require you to order a proof before you do your print run. Um, it's a really good idea to get a color proof, particularly for that photo book. Um, we poured over the color proofs for two days and we adjusted some of the photos based on the proofs. If you can provide a match print to the printer for a photo book, then oh, they can... Got this. Let's see. Um, then they can make sure that the color is right if it's important. Um, galley printing is, is really more of a marketing concern. All I do is set the book up to have it printed and then a lot of how it's how the galley is distributed is up to the marketing department. But um, hey guys, can you mute? Yeah. Great, can we mute? Excellent, thank you. Thanks. Um, you may find that a digital galley is sufficient. It depends on who you're sending the galley to. Um, some reviewers do accept e-galleys. Some of them will be happy if you just send them a, a small printed booklet, um, say a 16-page booklet out of a 200-page book. That may be perfectly sufficient, and then they can look at the rest of it online. Um, Laura, did you want to say something about NetGalley? I, I haven't dealt with them. Oh, myself. sure. Yeah, um, I, uh, I actually used to work for them. Um, <laughs> and and uh, they, are, they are truly um, great. They are the only digital galley distributor that has um, really large distribution. So basically what they do is they put the files up on their site, um, and the reviewers go to the site, request the, the files, and permission has to be granted. Um, for them to access the files, and then the files expire um, after a certain period of time, and the publisher determines what that period of time is going to be. Um, but this has massive outreach to uh, libraries, to book bloggers, other reviewers, um, people who are um, in charge of purchasing decisions at, at libraries, at schools, um, at bookstores. So a lot of very influential people use NetGalley, and um, it's really worth exploring. Um, <clears throat> if you are um, a small or independent publisher, you might consider um, kind of uh, creating a consortium with others that are about the same size. Um, because NetGalley's discounting is it, it's a volume discount, and if you're just you know publishing a couple of books a year, um, obviously there's no real way to take advantage of that. But if you partner with other independent publishers, um, they will accept galleys um, in those instances. All right, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Um, so resources for learning more, I just want to highlight a couple of these. Um, Lynda.com has extensive, extensive video library for learning pretty much everything to do with design production. Um, it's great. It costs money, but it's great. Um, Typedia, I already mentioned, printindustry.com has a form where you can put in all of the details about your publication and they will send it out, or actually I think they just post it to a mailing list. But all of these different printers will see it and they will all start barraging you with quotes. So it's a great way if you don't already have a printer that you're working with to get quotes from multiple printers at once. It's very efficient and um, the form will walk you through a lot of those production decisions that you'll want to make. And you can say, you know, we're not sure if we're doing this with this kind of cover or this kind of cover, can you quote me for both? Um, so you can, you can ask for customization, but it, it's helpful that it walks you through. Um, there are some fantastic books out there. These are just a handful. I think the most important is um, the Chicago Manual Style. It tells you everything. It's wonderful. It's a beautiful book. Um, if you are learning, if you want to do typesetting yourself, or you want to be an educated consumer of type, um, the Elements of Typographic Style is a classic. Um, it will show you what things should look like. And it's, a, it's just a beautiful book, and incredibly informative. If you want to learn to typeset yourself, I think The Complete Manual of Typography by James Felici is one of the best. It's the only book I've ever seen that really tells you 
how, the, how typography should be done, but also how you actually do it. How do you make copy fit in a book? How do you make it work um, in a real life setting? And so those are, those are my favorites out of this stack. The classroom and a book, if you're really learning from scratch, it will walk you through every part of the software. So that's, you know, it's useful, but it's a huge time investment. Um, remember that there are people and especially rely on printers reps. They know what they're talking about. It's their job. Printing is largely um, an industry that competes on service. Price is obviously a big component, but service is, I think, an even bigger one if you're building a long-term relationship with a printer. And if you find a customer service rep who's not helpful, switch printers. It's, it's just, it's not worth your time. You're not going to get results that you like. Um, if you find a customer service rep who is great, follow them if they leave their job, go to whatever printer they're going to. Um, it's, it's worth it to have that person who um, gives good service. Right now, our, our best service person um, for CN Times has been Ron Glick of New Jersey Printing. And he's a print broker, so he works with lots of printers. He can get quotes from all over the world, and um, he knows what each of those printers is good at. So print brokers are incredible resources for figuring out what you want to do, how it's possible, how you can make it affordable. Um, and InDesign User Group, the very last thing on here, is really useful. If you're in New York, I don't know how they do it in other cities, but in New York they have meetings every couple of months and they do tutorial sort of things where they walk you through different features of the software, they do demos, um, they show you what's possible, and it really expands your idea of what you could do with a future project. So if you're, if you're learning this for the long term, it's a great group to get involved with. And that's all I got. So, I'm great. Learned. So I great. think, India, yeah, you need to um, make uh, Alan the presenter. Did that work? Actually, uh, I'm sorry. We're going to make me the presenter, and Alan, I'll okay. show you a slide. Oh, whoops. That's okay. Did you guys see my slides? Mm, yes, I yet. got it. Okay, Alan. Okay, thank you, India. That was really very informative, and uh, hope I'll be able to do almost as well for uh, the ebooks portion of our uh, presentation. So you don't have to spend too much time on this slide because it doesn't convey that much useful information for what we want to do. Um, my background is in software and database design and in uh, ebook production. And I'm going to be on the more technical side about discussing what to think about as you prepare an ebook. But before that, if you could move to the next slide, um, let's need a little introduction to ebooks because everybody knows what a print book is, although they may not have any, have had too much of an idea before today's talk about how much may go into it. But most people are a little less familiar with ebooks in general. So I'm going to go over a few uh, concepts that are crucial to understanding what ebooks are about. And then, um, if time permits, we can dive into a little more detail. So I'm not going to read the slides. But again, as we mentioned before, if there are questions, feel free to uh, submit them. And we'll, see, we'll try to get to them either now or, or afterwards. So there's one basic distinction that's very important to understand with ebooks, fixed layout and reflowable layout. And I'll try to explain that because that's essential for understanding what happens afterwards. Reflowable formats are the ebook that you probably have seen when you read a novel on a device where you, the reader, control the font size and probably the font as well. You control whether it's vertical, horizontal, landscape portrait. Um, you can enlarge it or shrink it as you will. The page in the printed book has absolutely no relationship to the page in the ebook. It's, it's a totally different way of looking at it. It's basically just taking out the text with some design elements, but just focusing on the text and handing the text over to the reader. That is the reflowable ebook. The advantages of that is that um, it's very helpful for accessibility purposes because the font can be enlarged to a tremendous extent. 
It allows text searching, which is also extremely helpful, especially in a nonfiction book if you want to find any terms. Um, of course, it has the built-in linking of every ebooks where the table of contents can take you back and forth, and the index can take you back to those pages, and uh, you can navigate within the book. But the main thing to remember about ebooks is that reflowable ebooks are sort of the standard. Those are the ones that are supported by all devices. There's no such thing as an e-reader device that will not support a reflowable book, because then they're not an e-reader device. This is going to be different with fixed layout, but that's why I'm focusing on this. So reflowable is almost what one would call a standard ebook. And what's not so well known about that is that many books that people think are not suitable for becoming reflowable really could be. And we'll talk about that a little more later, but just to keep in mind that that is normally the target that we're looking for. So moving on to the next slide, the companion of reflowable books are fixed layout books. Fixed layout means, as the name implies, it looks like the printed source or the typeset source. There is no way for the user to change what is on a page. And it's ideal for children's books. I always think of the Dr. Seuss books as an example that most people can relate to, where you've got a picture filling up the spread, or single pages, or double pages, and a few words on each page. And that must remain. There's no way to have somebody split the page in two or uh, you know, put four of them on one screen. It's got to look the way the source looks. That's called fixed layout. Um, what it is appropriate when that is essential for the book to be read, the downsides of fixed layout are that the technology is much different than it is for the reflowable or standard ebooks. When it comes to fixed layout, um, each device family has their own standards. Uh, the iPads have one, the Kindles have another. Nook and Sony may not, well, Sony doesn't even support fixed layout, and Nook does, but you can't use any of the others. It's got to be a pr proprietary conversion. So fixed layout ebooks are immediately limited in their audience. Now, there's sometimes you can't get around it. If it is a children's book or, or a photo book or anything else where it is absolutely essential to convert it, it's almost like taking the PDF and uh, putting a PDF file on your device uh, with a few advantages. But fixed layout is really limited applicability, but where it does apply, it's very powerful. Different devices allow you to view them differently, so I don't want to be entirely negative about it. Um, if you have an iPad with a fixed layout book, you can pinch, you can zoom, and you can uh, make it somewhat controllable. If you have a Kindle, they have a, a double tap feature where some of the words on the page can be expanded, not to the extent that they are in reflowable ebooks, but they will pop up and then if the print was small, it will be significantly larger, but it's almost like just two sizes. There's a way the print looks on the page, and then you can pop it up to one other size as designed. So fixed layout has its place, but it's a minority of what ebooks are for. Moving on to the next slide, how do you design an ebook? Okay, keep going, please. Let's fill up the whole slide. So there are a number of items on here. Um, we, we heard a lot from India about the design on print. Design an ebook is slightly different because it is so controlled by the reader. There are not that many decisions that you can enforce when you're setting up the ebook. But there are certainly classes of information that you have to keep in mind. Um, as we list over here, there's images, there are tables, there are captions, there are page breaks, line breaks, uh, indented text, bulleted list, numbered list. There are things that will translate into ebooks, some better and some worse, and definitely must be kept in mind as you design the ebook. Of course, there's a difference if you're coming from print or you're coming from uh, design that you control. When you're coming from print, you're going to have a source that you're trying to match within the confines of the ebook. If you're going straight to ebook, then you really can design in the first place to take advantage of the strengths and try to avoid the weaknesses that are available on the devices. And I'm going to show some examples of those a little later on. Uh, 
Next slide, please. Um, if you fill up, fill up the whole slide. Thank you. So the production of the ebook, this is sort of like the basics. And unfortunately, it has to be mentioned because unlike print books, where you probably will never see a book that is just pathetically produced, unless somebody's doing it on their own and just circulating among their friends, but any professionally produced book or will meet certain standards. Uh, when it comes to ebook, we're not yet at that stage. So I'm mentioning these things as good output. You might think there's no way to have an ebook without it, but unfortunately uh, there are ebooks that you will find that have typos, that have bad characters, that do not pass the uh, industry standard ebook check, that Links go to the wrong place, so in the table of contents, you click on chapter four, and it'll take you to chapter six. Uh, and the images may be blurred, and so on. Formatting may not match. All of these things are required in good output. Again, in a print book, they go without saying. In an ebook, don't take them for granted. And that has a lot to do with the production, how you're having them produced. And we're going to continue with that. Uh, next slide, please. So. These are some of the factors that distinguish ebooks from print books. Um, a lot of it is automated. Nobody is uh, going in and converting the text. They're basically, uh, let me step back, they're converting the text. They're not re-inputting the text or taking it over again. However, there are limitations in the conversion, as we're going to see in some examples later on. There are certainly limitations on the devices that people are using to read their ebooks. So, uh, some non-standard styling may work on some devices and not on others. And obviously, if something was very highly stylized for print, you may have to or you will have to change that in order for it to work on an ebook. Um, and the last line, interestingly, interestingly uh, matches a point made at the beginning that you know free or cheap conversions are worth what you pay for them. An ebook is not something that you can just throw through the grinder, get a program to put out something looking nice. They will put out an ebook, but it will look amateurish unless it is an incredibly simple book that has nothing more than chapters and paragraphs. And even so, we're going to move on and see some examples where those don't work right either. The next slide. When converting from print, just keep in mind it's not a straight translation, as I've mentioned. Some things to look for are just the size of the how much you can fit on a page. Now, the screen is small, but the user rules. So the user can decide if there are three lines on the page or 40 lines on the page. So don't you want to make sure there's nothing in the design that relies on a specific page size or that will not work if it's split among across multiple pages. If there's no queue that ties them together and there has to be a queue, then you may have to think of converting it in a different way. And there are ways around it, but it's something to keep in mind. You do not know how much will be on one screen. Character sets, well, that goes into uh, when you're doing either highly technical books or foreign language books. You've got to make sure that your conversion will be supported on the devices that you're targeting for. MathML is not something that most people care about, but it's something if you're ever dealing with equations and you have math characters in the book, there is a way to natively embed them in ebooks, but it requires the EPUB 3 standard, which is, although it's the latest standard, it's not one that's been universally adopted. And the only foolproof way to have an ebook including equations and other math is to treat it as an image. That is the only foolproof way, but the disadvantage of images is that they're not considered part of the text in terms of searching, in terms of scaling. Some things to keep in mind. We're not going to learn them all here, but I just want to mention them. So now we're going to quickly move. We're running out of time. Just going to quickly move through some examples of concepts mentioned before. And this is more like just know that the ideas exist. Don't worry about the specifics. Um, this one just explains that if you have a table embedded within a paragraph, it looks fine. It looks excellent in a print book. The fact that the top of the page makes it stand out. Um, Remember, that doesn't translate to the ebook. If you put it right where it was in the print source, uh, it may it will sort of be orphaned. It doesn't it will break up the text. 
and depending on how much you see on each page, you may just have text with no relationship to anything before it. So if you look at the, uh, well, we're not going to, we don't have the next slide, but move on please to the next one. The right way to do a table is to pick a logical stopping point and then put the table there. Okay, next slide. Automated conversions. Some people say, what's the big deal about an ebook? I just pick up one of those programs, I send it through one of those internet services, I give them my file, and they give me back a file, and we're all set. Um, that may be true if you don't really look too closely. And again, there may be a case where it does convert properly, uh, but there are many cases where we don't even have those few things that I mentioned in the earlier slide required for a good output that we thought, what do you mean? Why well, mention it? But if you look at some of these examples now, you can see um, that even the simplest things may not convert more properly. Convert properly. Uh, next slide. So here are some examples, um, and right, th this is very hard to see um, on your screen. It will be easier if you're able to see this offline. But if you look on the left side, where it says Chapter One repeated over and over again, that's just a mistake introduced by the program. But this is actual. We didn't make this up and there are all these links to chapter one. Um, the emphasis not retained throughout some of the text, the paragraph breaks were not retained, the uh, header is not in the right place. This is an automated conversion. Uh, next slide, some more examples of an automated conversion. In example two, uh, we actually have some characters that are wrong. If you look at the fifth line, um, it should have said to be exact. Somehow it dropped the text. Don't know why, but this is automation. And one more slide. Some more examples of what an automation could do. If you notice the top call out, the word don't has got extra spaces. Um, four lines from the bottom, there's a space that disappeared. These are things that can happen and are not easy to catch if you don't have the right tools to do them. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is more of the same, looking at it with a fine tooth comb. Okay, we're just going to, again, I know we're running late, so I'm just going to quickly run through the next slide. Please go ahead. Importance of viewing actual device. Again, looking into conversions, there are going to be, depending on your source, significant differences between how it looks on the previewer, which is the left, and how it looks on an actual device, which is the right. Something to keep in mind. And I think we're go I'm not even going to go through the other slides that we have now. We have a large deck of examples. But I think let's, if we can move on to the very last slide, which summarizes the section, which is that an automated conversion, now that we understand what an ebook target is, an automated conversion is not just taking your source file and feeding you through the grinder and getting something out at the other end. There are de design decisions that have to be made. Um, it's, as with typesetting, you can tell if something was done professionally or not done professionally. When you see a nice product, you don't even realize all the things that went behind, went into it to produce the nice product. But I hope that the, over the last few minutes, we've gained appreciation of some of the factors that would be involved in e-books, just as in print books. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, India, Alan. This definitely has been a very informative uh, webinar indeed. We've had some questions come in, so I'm going to read them off, um, and, and hopefully we'll answer them. And the first question that came in, um, and India, I think this is more towards you, is um, what is a deckle edge? A deckle edge is when you are making paper, when you the way paper is made, um, it's, it's the edge that's around the frame. So it's the raw edge of the paper that normally you would trim it off so you get that clean, sharp cut. Um, but on some books, they would leave that raw edge on. It's also um, older books, like 19th century, 18th century, you would actually, you would receive the book with the pages still looped together where there was a fold at the outer edge, and you would use your paper knife to cut each page open. So you'd end up with this lovely tactile raw edge. So publishers will still do this to make a book seem more deluxe, um, to make it seem more literary. 
Thank you very much, India. Um, the next question I, I, is going to be directed towards both you and Alan. And the question is, um, going back to your presentation, India, was there, these were excellent design guidelines for print books. Are there something special specific to digital, to digital books? A surprising amount of what you can do in print books can be carried over to digital books, um, at least on some platforms. But um, a lot of, I would say, I, I think what the, the questioner is getting at is, is, are there things you can do to make digital books more readable? And I think a lot of those guidelines are going to be the same as guidelines for making good web text. Um, and there is a lot of documentation on that online. We start looking about how to make a readable web page. Alan, do you have anything to, to say about this? Um, well, I think we've gone through a bunch of examples, and I totally agree that much of design that works in print can be carried forward to ebooks. But again, based on the limitations of the devices, that's something you have to keep in mind because once the book is published, you really can't control where it's being read. So you have to be able to balance the design elements with the capabilities of the target devices. Uh, one, one major difference would be linearity, where in a book you can have elements side by side. Uh, that rarely works in an ebook simply because the screen is so narrow. And if you take up a portion of the screen for one element, you've taken away that much of a relatively small screen for another. So we generally recommend that everything become linear. And if you have, for example, a recipe book, you don't put the recipe and the photo side by side, but you have one following the other. But that's not to say you wouldn't have a beautiful looking ebook at the end, but it would be designed for an ebook world more than for a print world. Well, thank you much. Um, this question is again both, uh, directed to both of you, and I'll ask Alan first, and then India, you can follow up. And the question is: Is indexing still necessary for eBooks? Well, that's a good question. It's not necessary, but personally, I would say it's very advisable because the index is still a visual place which uh, combines all the ideas in the book, and indexing itself is an art which deserves its own series of webinars, but the items included in an index I find are informative. So technically, you can find anything in the book by just doing a search, and you'll find everywhere it's mentioned. But the index represents knowledge of the indexer where they have chosen certain portions of the book to be linked to because they feel that those are meaningful portions as opposed to just simply uh, cataloging appearances of words. So by Converting the index, you retain all that effort that was put in, and the ebook makes it very easy to link to the sections mentioned in the index. Yes, India. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think if if a if there was a good index in the print book, and there are a lot of bad indexes out there, but a, a high quality index is very much worth keeping in the ebook. Um, it's a bit of a pain to convert, but I do think it's worth it because. That index will help connect parts of the book that you wouldn't be able to find on a search. Um, if you have differences in how terms are worded, if you have dogs in one place and canines in the other, they're not going to show up on a search in the same place. So you're going to have to do a series of searches. You're going to have to anticipate every term that the author might have used to describe that concept throughout the book, whereas a good index will link all of those things together under subheads that you can find and you can have cross-references that will help direct you to the correct subhead. And it's, it's really its, its own work, it's its own entity that adds value to the book. Excellent. Um, the next question, uh, in, I believe, is geared more towards India. And the question is, I've written a book in Word. Is that not an acceptable form to send to a book designer? Word is the form that most book designers are used to getting. Um, we don't love it, but we are used to it. OK, great. Um, if I could just question. jump in, I will just, sure. I would just add, Adam, to say, and it's also, if you want to go straight to eBooks, Word Source is fine as well. The only thing it doesn't show you is the styling um, that you might want to have at the end. But since eBook styling may be different anyhow, 
uh, it's really no disadvantage to have word source when you're going straight to ebooks. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, should we justify alignment for ebooks or not? I think uh, not. <laughs> the reading system doesn't give uh, designers a choice, so Kindle will actually reject books where you turn justification off. I think this is a big mistake. Okay. Alan? Total, to totally agree. The only time it comes in is when you have fixed layout, uh, because then you're really mimicking the original layout on the page, and then it's a line-by-line -line match, so then, uh, even then, justification makes it very hard, but that's the only place where I can see an argument for it. Uh, but on a reflowable ebook, it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, as we can see in the slide that's still up, you end up, um, when you increase the font size, you end up with very hard to read spacing. And since you can't anticipate what device you're going to be reading on, um, it's, it really doesn't make sense. If you can turn off justification, I think it's, it's a real service to the reader. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question has come in, there's a couple more to go, um, is, and it's a little bit long one, so please bear with me. My Kindle file, file looks good on Kindle and reader apps, but in the look inside view on Amazon, the text is not justified. I thought Kindle justifies on default. Any idea why the look inside would not reflect that? No. <laughs> Um, the look inside renderer is weird, and I know people who have submitted some bug reports to them very recently about display issues. So it's just a, an inconsistency, and I don't know how you could plan for it. Um, but I've never heard of that happening, but I'm not surprised. Okay, Alan. So I have, sorry, I have nothing else to add. You said it all. Okay. Um, there are two more questions, and the, the second to last question is, what is the best format to use for submitting to designers? Um, if we're talking about print design, again, like I said, Word is pretty much the industry standard. It's what most publishing houses use. It's what designers are used to getting. Um, I'm okay with it if, if the Word file is constructed well. Um, some other things to consider, though, um, Markdown, which is a, a very simple markup language for plain text. Um, I would love to get manuscripts in Markdown for typesetting because it just it eliminates a lot of um, gunk that I have to clean out before I can typeset the book. So um, something very simple would be ideal. And there are other word processing programs um, that can generate RTF files rich text format, that's fine. Um, but really, it doesn't matter. Your designer has seen it all. They've seen every horrible format you can imagine. If they have specific requests, they will let you know. Okay. And, and, and just a quick follow-up question would be, what, what do you mean by well-marked down Word files? Uh, um, Markdown is its own language, so it's, it's based on old email conventions. So, say, um, if you want italic, you put asterisks around something or an underscore on either side of the word. If you want bold, you put two asterisks. It just it, it simplifies everything and you can transmit it over plain text. And so there's, there's not a lot of variation. You can't pick the fonts in Markdown. Um, a well-marked up Word file would be one that uses Word styles. So Word has built-in heading levels, heading one, heading two, heading three, to use those rather than to say, I'm going to make all of my headings purple um, 16 point, and I'm going to do that by hand for each single one. If you use Word style sheets, then the designer can carry those over into the layout program and doesn't have to restyle them from scratch. It's hard to explain, though, over the over webinar. <laughs> it's its own <laughs> webinar. All right, well, thank you. And the last question that I have received um, it looks like it's, it's more geared towards Alan. And the question is, I know that my ebook can link to websites. Can it link to another ebook? Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, people have asked that, and you would think it'd be intuitive. Just, you know, as, as you know, when you're in your browser, any link can go to any other link, and from there you can keep going all over the place. Uh, but the answer to the question is no. 
Uh, the technology is that uh, each ebook stands alone, and even if you produce a few of them together, uh, you can't say, see page 73 in my other ebook. Uh, there is no technology today that does that. Now, uh, people are talking about it, and theoretically, there's no reason why it couldn't be done, assuming you have that ebook available to you on your device. But given the current state of the technology, no, each ebook stands alone. It does let you link outwards. Of course, you can go from the ebook out to any site on the internet, and you can uh, launch a program, and you can have audio, video, and all that good stuff. But you can't go into another ebook. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Well, that was all the questions we received. So I got to say thank you, thank you everyone for attending, and I definitely got to thank again India, Laura, and Alan for for this very informative presentation. Um, you can uh, view the recorded version of today's webinar in the archives section of our website, which is www.dcl.com, dclab.com. <clears throat> and just want to send a reminder that our next webinar will be next Wednesday, July 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern, Eastern Daylight Time, titled Reducing Costs Through Document Automation for a More Efficient Workplace being presented by Ari Gross, CTO of C-Vision Technologies. Thank you everyone for attending and have a great day.